Eight medical staff diagnosed with the CCP virus in one of Harbin City's main hospitals. An exclusive recording obtained by NTD reveals the poor practices leading up to it. A missing citizen journalist in China has reappeared in a new video, but many are questioning if he is truly okay now. A new French report delves into concerns surrounding the Wuhan P4 lab, pointing out troubling patterns through the years. Pressure is mounting in the UK as many urge the country to rethink its relationship with the Chinese regime. We take a deep dive into the UK's economic ties to China and see where things might be heading amidst this pandemic. And more European markets reporting defective personal protective equipment or PPE coming from China. Find out the impact it's having on medical staff. Welcome to China In Focus, I'm Tiffany Meyer. There's speculation that the Wuhan Institute of Virology could be the origin of the CCP virus. It's a P4 lab, the highest biosafety level. Radio France investigated how France helped China to build the lab in 2004, but was then excluded from the project. The idea was to fight infectious diseases together, but the move caused concern in France. The article said China refused to tell France what happened to the mobile P3 laboratories that were funded by French government after the SARS epidemic in 2003. China's lack of transparency made the French uneasy. So some in the French government thought problems would also come with the P4 lab project. In 2015, France gave up its co-chairmanship position on the commission that supervised the P4 lab, describing the lab as a very Chinese tool. In 2017, France announced that 50 French researchers would reside there for five years. But this didn't happen in the end. No reason was given. The Washington Post reported in January 2018 that the American embassy visited the lab and saw it was studying back coronaviruses. They said the lab's security measures were insufficient and alerted Washington. Li Jiehua, a Chinese citizen journalist, posted a video on social media on April 22nd. It's his first video since going missing in Wuhan nearly two months ago. He went to Wuhan in February to report on what he saw there. On February 26th, he was arrested by police. In his latest video, he described what happened to him since then. He first was chased by a car of unknown people. He posted this live on social media. He was then taken away by police and accused of disrupting public order. He stayed overnight at the police station. Over the course of those 24 hours, I sat on an iron stool and talked to many different police officers. The police then told him that he will not be punished. But because he had been in a virus hotspot, he had to be quarantined in Wuhan for 14 days. Once he arrived at the quarantine, his phone and electronic devices were taken away. Lee didn't criticize the authorities in the video. One netizen commenting, this video looks like a hostage reading a manuscript. But as long as you're safe, it's good. Sweden's second largest city, Gothenburg, is canceling its sister city relationship with Shanghai. The two have been tied for 34 years. It comes after Sweden shut down all Confucius institutes in the country, the first European state to do so. There's a new movement growing in Italy of people wanting to sue the Chinese regime for the pandemic. An online petition just launched lets Italians affected by the virus seek compensation from Beijing. The head of the organization behind the movement, One Europe, estimates over 500,000 will sign, and the compensation sought could exceed 100 billion euros. And a popular hotel in the Italian Alps is also suing China for damages. It says China failed to inform the WHO in a timely manner, causing the pandemic to spiral out of control. The hotel was fully booked for the ski season, but suffered devastating losses as all hotels were forced to close on March 12th. This follows lawsuits from India and some U.S. states. British think tank Henry Jackson Society published a 44-page report analyzing the legal basis for suing Beijing over the virus.
And China announced today it will give another $30 million to the WHO. This comes just days after President Trump said the U.S. would freeze funding. The U.S. was the organization's biggest contributor, giving a whopping $893 million between 2018 and 2019. China gave $86 million over the same time period. China state-run media recently announced eight medical staff were diagnosed with the CCP virus at one of the main hospitals in Harbin City. An exclusive recording obtained by NTD reveals poor management practices could be facilitating the rapid spread of the virus in hospitals. NTD Xu Wenrong has the details. A report published by Chinese state-run media on April 22nd said two doctors and six nurses were diagnosed with the virus at a major hospital in Harbin City. More than 200 medical staff from the hospital were under observation in quarantine centers. Around 190 others were sent home to self-quarantine. Only about 130 remained working in the hospital. The same hospital announced two days earlier it would not take any more new patients because of recent virus infections at the hospital. NTD obtained an exclusive internal recording of a meeting among medical staff at that hospital earlier this month. The tape revealed an emergency patient at Harbin's other main hospital was transferred to the respiratory ward and later diagnosed with the CCP virus. Staff at the meeting added this person infected patients in that department, as well as medical staff. A family member of one of Harbin Hospital's staff told us Harbin City and Heilongjiang Province officials have been terrified since they were held accountable for the virus spreading. The officials pushed that pressure onto the community and started treating Harbin like a second Wuhan. It's hard to live now. They are sealing our doors. Even if they don't seal our doors, we don't dare to go out. The people see us as poison. They are all afraid. Mr. Xiao's wife works in the cafeteria at a hospital in Harbin's Daoli district. She's been quarantined for seven or eight days in the hospital, even though her nucleic acid test came back negative. Now Mr. Xiao is also being forced to quarantine at home. The authorities padlocked his front door from the outside. The door of the house is sealed to prevent me from going out. My daughter brings me groceries. I call her and she passes it to me through the window. Similarly, videos circulating online appear to show residential areas in Harbin forced into lockdown. Some netizens are angry about the way the regime handled the lockdown, saying they don't treat people like people, locking them inside. What if they got sick? What if a fire broke out? Another netizen said the history of Wuhan is now repeating in Harbin. State media reported that one man spread the virus to 78 people from Harbin, other cities in Heilongjiang province, as well as people from other provinces. Reporting by Shu Wenrong, NTD News. The UK is among the hardest hit places in this pandemic, and its prime minister is the first head of state to contract the virus. Today, we take a deep dive into the UK's economic ties with China and see where things might be heading amidst this pandemic. Voices are rising in the UK, urging its government to rethink its ties to China. The calls come over the regime's mishandling of the pandemic. Uh, but there's no doubt we, we can't have business as usual after this crisis, and we'll have to ask the hard questions about how it came about and how it couldn't have been stopped earlier. Just five years ago, then-Prime Minister David Cameron declared the beginning of a golden era for the UK-China relationship. So this visit marks the start of a new era. Some have called it a golden era in relations between Britain and China. In 2015, the UK threw a lavish welcome for the Chinese regime's leader, Xi Jinping. Cameron even took Xi out for a pint. By the end of Xi's visit, the two countries signed over $60 billion worth of deals. Under Cameron and then Finance Minister George Osborne, the UK left its door wide open for Chinese money and pushed for closer economic ties. There is no economy in the West that is as open to Chinese investment as the United Kingdom. You know, we we welcome Chinese investment. There is huge amounts of Chinese investment coming into Britain at the moment. Indeed, we're attracting more investment than Germany, France and Italy put together uh, into the UK. The flagship UK project funded by Chinese investment was a new nuclear power station at Hinkley Point in southwest England. Chinese state-owned company China General Nuclear Power Group, or CGN, 
took a one-third stake in the $28 billion plant, which was built by a French group. We've created a model where we can attract Chinese investment into civil nuclear power. In return, CGN was allowed to build and operate its own facility at another site. The project was highly controversial. One of the main risks? Handing some control over critical British infrastructure to China. When former UK Prime Minister Theresa May took over, the project was put on hold for review, though it was eventually given the green light. But last year, new questions emerged about CGN's involvement when the company was blacklisted by the U.S. Commerce Department for attempting to steal nuclear technology. Chinese investment in the U.K. covers many areas, from the famous London black cabs to Heathrow Airport, from Barclays Bank to Thames Water. But it's most often focused in the energy sector. Chinese investment peaked in 2017, reaching $20 billion. In comparison, the Netherlands received less than $4 billion and Germany less than $2 billion in the same year. Aside from investment, trade between Britain and China also doubled within a decade. And with the UK now out of the European Union, Downing Street is free to hammer out a new trade deal with China. Our ambition is for more trade, not less trade. And China clearly shares this ambition. Some UK officials have said the country is China's best partner in the West. It was the first Western country to become a founding member of the AIIB, short for Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Launched in 2016, the China-led $50 billion project was designed to provide infrastructure funds in Asia. It's considered a rival to World Bank and the existing Asian Development Bank, a U.S.-backed institution. The U.K.'s move to join angered the U.S. as Washington has raised concerns about the new bank's management and lending standards. U.S. officials saw establishing the new bank as an extension of Beijing's soft power. Contrasting her predecessor's eagerness to join the AIIB, Theresa May was reluctant to endorse another of the Chinese regime's projects, the Belt and Road Initiative. The massive infrastructure project is said to include over 70 countries and cover more than two-thirds of the world's population. Belt and Road is a cornerstone of the Chinese Communist Party's aggressive foreign policy goals and expansionist goals. That comment comes from a U.S. Senate hearing about the initiative last year. Critics also say it will trap poor countries in debt. Despite ongoing concerns, current Prime Minister Boris Johnson has expressed great interest in the initiative. Listen, we are very enthusiastic about the Belt and Road Initiative. We're very interested in, in uh, the, uh, what uh, President Xi is doing. And the most recent example of the UK's deep economic ties to China, the country's decision to open the 5G market to Chinese telecom giant Huawei. Huawei has been operating in the UK for two decades, and it's a major supplier to Britain's biggest telecom company, BT. The relationship was investigated in 2012 over potential security concerns. Huawei is now widely reported as having close links to the communist regime. And there's not only a legal requirement, but there's deep financial investment. You have senior leaders in these companies that are tied to the Chinese Communist Party. We think that. It's not about a technical back door. They have the front door. Despite the U.S.'s repeated warning, Johnson's government decided in January to include Huawei in the rollout of the country's 5G networks, with a market share cap of 35 percent. Last year, shortly before he was chosen as prime minister, Boris Johnson told a Chinese-language TV station that he would be pro-China. But now, anger is rising at the Chinese regime for its handling of the pandemic. Johnson is under increasing pressure to reassess the Chinese regime's position as a trusted partner. And last week, the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee warned that those helping Beijing to target British businesses would face scrutiny. This after the UK government stopped a Chinese company's attempt to take over a British chipmaker. It's the same group that tried to buy American chipmaker Lattice before the deal was stopped by President Trump in 2017. In Europe, a scarcity of personal protective equipment is making some hospitals and businesses turn to imported items from China, sometimes at their own peril. Our France correspondent David Vives has the story. Made in China. Agualan Vega says she never knows what will happen when she opens a box of masks. She works as a nurse in a Paris hospital. As with other hospitals in France, some of the masks come from China. Sometimes the mask's elastic just breaks at the moment we put them on, or the metal clip doesn't fit the nose. 
Defective personal protective equipment, or PPE, imported from China, continues to flood the European market. Spain on Wednesday said it was seeking a full refund for 640,000 virus test kits from Chinese company BioEasy after returning a second faulty batch meant to replace the first. Companies specialized in sourcing masks warn of Chinese companies using questionable business practices to attract buyers from Europe. Some Chinese companies fake certificates that they use to sell their merchandise to make it look like the items are up to European and American standards when they are not. NTD contacted VVR International, a company with 20 years experience sourcing high standard PPEs in China. We are currently working on more than 70 cases. I can say only 10% of them meet European and American standards. But that doesn't seem to discourage some buyers. Some people rather get poor quality masks than no masks at all. I can understand that. It's a very tense situation. According to the European Safety Federation, which monitors the quality of imported PPEs, more European companies are turning to mask producers in their own continent. Reporting by David Vivez, NTD News, Paris. A U.S. lawmaker is voicing concern that Chinese drones used to enforce social distancing measures are a threat to national security. The Chinese company that makes them is backed by the communist regime. U.S. lawmakers and experts have concerns over the Chinese-made drones making their way into police and fire departments across the U.S. They suspect a potential national security threat because the devices can send data back to China. The world's largest consumer drone manufacturer, DJI, sent 100 of its drones to 22 states. Police use the drones to enforce social distancing guidelines. But federal agencies have already flagged the Chinese company suspecting it of sending data to the Chinese communist regime. The drones can record critical infrastructure and law enforcement data. The agencies warn against the use of these drones, some even wanting to outright ban them. Senator Rick Scott called the situation crazy on Twitter. He wrote that the Chinese Communist Party was responsible for the spread of the virus. And now to help combat the virus's spread, drones from a company backed by the regime are used across the U.S. The U.S. now has over 850,000 confirmed cases, and states one after another plan to reopen. The latest, Oklahoma and Montana. But in some areas, there's controversy over how and when to do it. And Didi's Melina Weiskup brings us the story. Oklahoma and Montana are among the latest to lift stay-at-home orders. Some Oklahoma businesses are restarting tomorrow, while Montana has its sights set on Monday. Main Street and retail businesses can reopen their doors, but that doesn't mean that things should be just like they were before the virus. The states are joining at least five others in the South, which are already coordinating and plan to lift restrictions by the end of the month. But in some places, controversy is brewing over the decisions. Michigan's stay-at-home order has been extended. Michiganers will still need to stay home unless they're doing things that are explicitly permitted by the order. But some residents have expressed frustration and are protesting the shutdown. Likewise, a sheriff in Washington opposes the governor's decision for a longer shutdown. The sheriff wrote a letter calling it a constitutional rights violation and says he won't enforce it. Nearby, California residents are also protesting the stay-at-home order. Like here in Los Angeles, cars honk to express their discomfort with the lockdown. California saw its deadliest day yesterday. There was some positive news. Uh, despite those numbers. He's referring to hospitalizations and number of ICU patients slightly dropping. And in a town near Silicon Valley, officials have started testing all residents for the CCP virus and antibodies. Testing is a top priority for states reopening, as the Trump administration is ramping up contact tracing in hopes of safely reopening the economy. Melina Weiskup, NTD News. New York's governor said yesterday he's working on a joint program with Connecticut and New Jersey to trace people who could have been exposed to the virus. And California is working to train thousands of state workers to contact trace in their state. Doctors in New York noticed that many patients with the virus are having strokes. And looking deeper, they are alarmed to find that patients' blood also thins and clots. Doctors in New York found something troubling in ICU patients infected with the virus. 
Many of them were having strokes, and upon treating them, doctors were struck to find blood clots. Dr. Mako said he noticed this as cases started to take off in New York. Um, I was discussing with the president of the hospital how pro-coagulant this experience was, and he immediately said, you have to talk with Dr. Poor because he's been noticing the same things in the lungs. His colleague, Dr. Poor, found that blood was not circulating freely through the lungs of his patients on ventilators. That night, a kidney doctor told him that dialysis catheters were often getting blocked with clots. So they started to give patients high doses of blood thinners even before blood clots were detected. And uh, together we discussed, um, you know, which patients would most likely benefit from this. And most importantly, these drugs are very um, dangerous. They can cause catastrophic bleeding. Blood thinners have become a part of the hospital's toolbox, but Dr. Mako said they're still learning about the virus. Harvard University says it will refuse the $9 million in relief funds provided by the CARES Act. This decision comes after President Trump demanded the university pay the money back, saying the institution is already well endowed. Harvard has announced the university will not accept the $9 million in relief funds allotted to it by the CARES Act. On Tuesday, President Trump demanded the university pay the money back, but Harvard declined to do so. Amid mounting pressure from the president and several lawmakers, Harvard decided to decline the funding. The university stated the attention it was getting surrounding the money was not worth the relief it was designed to provide. President Trump stated on Tuesday he didn't like that Harvard was to receive relief money when the institution has about a $40 billion endowment or investment fund. The president said the relief money is meant to help workers instead. I don't like it. I don't like it. This is meant for workers. This isn't meant for one of the richest institutions, not only far beyond schools, in the world. They got to pay it back. I want them to pay it back. Harvard had received the relief payment from the Department of Education, not from the Paycheck Protection Program administered through the Small Business Administration. Many senators, including Ted Cruz, Josh Hawley, and Rick Scott, have criticized using taxpayer money to bail out the university. Donald Trump Jr. also disagrees with the allocation. In a Twitter post, he cited the arrest of Harvard professor Charles Lieber, who allegedly failed to disclose research funding from the Chinese Communist Party, as evidence Harvard should not receive the funding. In a statement on Wednesday, Education Secretary Betsy DeVos said it is common sense that wealthy institutions that do not primarily serve low-income students should not get additional taxpayer funds. Harvard noted that the Department of Education decides how to reallocate the funds, but asked to give special consideration to struggling institutions in Massachusetts. Mexico and the U.S. eye an agreement to reopen their supply chain after virus restrictions dampened it. India puts restrictions on Chinese investment and more in business and economic news. Over 4.4 million Americans applied for unemployment benefits last week. Those receiving unemployment benefits were almost at 16 million the week before that. Total jobless claims for the past five weeks reached 26 million, but the pace of layoffs is apparently lessening. 43 states saw less jobless claims. The Mexican president said he expects an agreement that will allow U.S.-Mexico industrial supply chains to begin operating normally again. Operating restrictions on businesses designated non-essential have caused disruptions to supply chains. Mexico has only just entered its highest phase of alert because of growing CCP virus cases. India's plans to screen foreign direct investments from neighboring countries has Chinese firms concerned. They fear it will delay deals in one of Asia's most lucrative investment markets. The tougher rules were not a surprise. Other countries are also on guard against fire sales of corporate assets during the pandemic. Two pet cats have been confirmed to have the virus. The CDC made the announcement Wednesday. It's the first time the virus has been found in domestic animals in the U.S. The cats were from different areas of New York State and both were taken to vets because they had mild respiratory illness. The first cat came from a household in which none of the residents had any symptoms. The second cat's owner was later diagnosed with the virus. But another cat in the same household appeared to show no signs of infection. Both cats are expected to make a full recovery. And German Chancellor Angela Merkel warned her citizens not to relax social distancing measures, saying the virus is far from over.
German Chancellor Angela Merkel said on Thursday that we are not living in the final phase of the pandemic. She said we are still at the beginning and have to act accordingly. Just yesterday, the European country gave a green light to human trials of the potential CCP virus vaccines. The trial is only the fourth in the world of a vaccine targeting the virus. And according to UK's top medical officer, a vaccine is needed in order to ease restrictions on the island country. He said the measures are likely to be needed even after this year ends. Meanwhile, the government is under fire for allegedly failing to fully explain partial death data, for providing only limited testing and for a lack of equipment for hospitals. And in a Finnish supermarket, doors without door handles were tested earlier this week. The shape of the handle allows the door to be opened with an arm instead of a hand. Its goal is to prevent the spread of microbes through door handles. Norway could see its biggest decline in mortgage demand since the 2008 financial crisis. The decline is caused by the effects of the virus outbreak. And now to Australia, where the nation's prime minister today threw his support behind an independent probe into the pandemic. He says all member nations of the WHO should support a review and be obliged to participate in it. Australian leader Scott Morrison said on Thursday that all member nations of the WHO should support an independent review into the coronavirus pandemic's origins and spread. It's a move that could put further strain on ties with China. We will need an independent inquiry that uh, looks at what has occurred here so we can learn the lessons. Australia has become one of Beijing's most forceful critics over the handling of the spread of the coronavirus. Beijing has called these efforts US-led propaganda against China. But Morrison defended calls for the inquiry as earnest in nature. Our purpose here is just pretty simple. Um, We'd like the world to be safer when it comes to viruses. That seems like a pretty honest ambition that I'm sure most people in the world would agree with. So it'd be great if we could achieve that. And that's the spirit in which we're pursuing this. And I I would certainly hope that any other nation, be it China or anyone else, um, would, uh, would share that objective. Australia's call for global action comes as it has seen success in slowing the coronavirus with around 6,600 cases of infection and less than 80 deaths. Morrison says Australia will push for the inquiry during the WHO assembly on May 17th. And now to Germany. In this economic crisis, it's seeking to protect its industry from unwanted takeovers, including from China. Today, its parliament discussed a new bill. NTD's Germany correspondent Christian Watchin has the story. On Thursday, Germany's parliament, the Bundestag, discussed a reform to its foreign direct investment rules. The government wants to make it harder for investors outside the European Union to acquire companies active in critical infrastructures and critical technologies. The fact that we are a market economy does not mean that we can be naive when it comes to risks and threats to our vital national economic health and other interests. The new rules would mean all investments of 10% or more are pending until clearance is granted, and the threshold for a mandatory government review would be lowered from actual danger to likely detriment to public order or security. German industry associations and some opposition parties criticize the new rules as protectionism. To seal us off here won't help us in this discussion. Newly added to mandatory approval are companies active in critical technologies, such as artificial intelligence, robotics, semiconductors, biotechnology, and quantum technology. Some observers see this as a direct swipe at the CCP. Its Made in China 2025 program seeks global domination exactly these fields. And some are concerned China could use the current crisis to go on a shopping spree in Europe. Under the old rules, the German government unsuccessfully tried to stop the takeover of German industrial robot maker KUKA to a Chinese investor four years ago. The bill is likely to pass. Reporting by Christian Watchin, NTD News, Berlin. Here at China In Focus, we dedicate ourselves to bringing you truthful, unbiased reporting. Don't forget to subscribe for the latest updates and see you tomorrow.